Hello everyone, welcome to today's webinar. This one is a bit different to our general straight off the horses mouse webinar series, but it's a deep dive into the Garvey LCA packaging calculator. It's a follow up from a previous webinar, Packaging Unwrapped. Our technical director, Jeff Rickers, will talk you through all the details of the packaging calculator. We will keep it interactive so if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A box and Jeff will get to them as he's going through. He'll start off with a brief introduction of what it's all about and then we'll get right into it. I'll hand over to Jeff now to do Packaging Sustainability Part 2, the Garvey LCA Packaging Calculator. Welcome Jeff and over to you. So thanks, Barbara, for the introduction, um, and thanks all for joining us today. My name is Jeff Vickers, I'm Technical Director at ThinkStep ANZ, and today, as Barbara mentioned, I want to take you on a guided tour through the Garvey Packaging Calculator. For those of you who joined us last month, um, I'm going to present some of the same slides again at the beginning, because I'm conscious there's a few people on this call who weren't with us last month, so apologies if this bit's a little bit repetitive, but I'll just do a sort of five to ten minute refresher on lifecycle thinking before we dive into the Garvey pack Packaging Calculator for implementing lifecycle assessment. So just to rewind a little bit before we get into the detailed numbers, the goal of life cycle thinking is really to avoid solving one problem by creating another. And I want to introduce the concept of life cycle thinking by looking at three concepts. So three concepts to get you to one concept. The first one I want to talk about is the idea of a product life cycle metaphor. So something we've stolen from nature where you take, you know, raw materials out of the ground or from a previous product system you manufacture them into something useful. You transport that to the customer. They use it, you know, in this case for storing milk. And then it's, they have to make a choice to dispose of that product, whether it ends up in landfill or joins another product cycle through reuse or recycling, or ends up being incinerated or whatever the outcome may be, something happens at end of life. And so what we're trying to do is look at all of those different life cycle stages rather than just one to avoiding shifting problems elsewhere. So elsewhere in the supply chain or downstream in the value chain to other life cycle stages. The next concept is really that we want to avoid shifting impacts, shifting burdens from one environmental compartment to another. So avoiding, for example, reducing your carbon footprint by contributing to increased acid rain, for example, or by increasing your you know, summer smog while, while reducing your contribution to eutrophication, which causes algal blooms. So the point is just that we consider multiple impacts across the full life cycle of the product to help avoid shifting problems. And the final concept I wanted to touch on regarding to life cycle thinking is, is the idea of the functional unit. The idea that to compare things, you have to do it fairly. So you have to, you have to focus on the need that's being met rather than the way of meeting that need. So, you know, for example, a kind of classic example used in life cycle thinking is the idea of drying a pair of hands. You're in a public toilet or whatever, you've washed your hands, how do you dry them? You could choose to either use a Dyson air blade or another air hand dryer. You could use two paper towels, you could use three paper towels, you could use a cotton roller towel, you could dry your hands on your pants, you know, you could do any kind of other things that you might like to do. And the idea of a functional unit helps you to relate those things so it's not, you know, you're not delivering two hand towels, rather you're delivering a pair of dry hands, which requires two hand towels, or which requires 10 seconds on an air hand dryer, or which requires two pulls on a cotton roller towel. And then all the things that are associated with that, so the washing associated with the cotton roller towel, or the production of a Dyson air blade, or the manufacturing of two hand towels. So the idea is that we compare fairly by using this concept of a functional unit to help say, okay, what is the need we're trying to meet? What are we really trying to do with this product? not what is the product. And so those three concepts com combined, looking at avoiding burden shifting and comparing fairly, are the three kind of core ideas I wanted to communicate about life cycle thinking today, and hopefully will guide us through the rest of this discussion. So I want to look at a case study, and apologies for those who saw this last time, but just to refresh your memory, we want to look at the case study of one litre of fresh milk at the consumer. And if we have that idea in mind, we've got lots of different ways that we could deliver that milk. So we could put it in HDPE bottle, as is common in Australia and New Zealand. We could put it in a recycled HDPE bottle. We could put it in a bio HDPE bottle. We could do something crazy and move outside of HDPE and instead use PET. That PET could be recycled, so it could be our PET. 
We could put it in a carton. We could put it in glass, which is a single use glass bottle. We could put it in reusable glass. We could even put it in a bag. So if you think that's a bit weird, if you go to Canada, they often use milk bags and you put them inside a little um, jug that you have at home. Some of the jugs have a little piercing thing, you pierce the bag and it has a spout and then you pour the milk out of that. So it's quite a lightweight way of transporting milk. Or we could do something completely off the wall and you know, teleport the milk directly into a jug in your fridge. Or my personal favorite, the idea that you just have a cow at home that you milk yourself as needed. So today I wanna to focus in on two of those options. I think uh, teleportation and the domestic mini cow will be a bit hard to quantify through the Gabby Packaging Cafe. So we'll focus in on two that are a bit more realistic and particularly glass and reusable glass. And if we're looking at glass as a material type, we need to look at all the different stages that are associated with making that glass. So we have to extract raw materials. We have to have some kind of heat to produce the glass in the glass making stage. We have to produce a cap to go on the bottle and a label. The bottles need to go in some kind of secondary packaging to get them to the place where they're filled and then also to get them to the store where you're buying the product from. And so there's a whole transport stage there. And then at some point, the glass bottle reaches its end of life, either after a single use or after multiple uses. And so if we're looking at that single use bottle, if we look at it on this left-hand side, we've effectively got all of the emissions associated with making that single use bottle. In a multi-use case, it's very similar, except the bottle might be a bit thicker. So we've got a bit more glass and therefore a bit more impact. We've also got to wash the bottle because it needs to be clean before we put new milk in. And we have to get the bottle back to the point where it can be refilled. And finally, we have to recognize the benefit from not making the same bottle again in the next life cycle. And so if you stack all that stuff up together, you start with the single bottle, you add the, thick, the thicker wall, you add the cleaning stage, you add the truck, and you get the benefit back for the reuse. And so what you end up is something like this, the single use on the left and the multi-use on the right. This is a way of sort of thinking about this life cycle thinking, but if we want to quantify it, we need to take a next step to life cycle assessment. So in short, we need to make it nerdy. We need to put some real numbers around this to make it a real sort of example rather than just a hypothetical. So what I want to do today is to talk through how you would make this comparison of a single use glass bottle versus a multi-use glass bottle in the Gabi packaging calculator. And so what you can see here is you've got three layers of packaging, consumer, display, shipment. The consumer packaging is the thing that the user touches and feels and goes home with them from the supermarket. The display packaging is where what they see the, the product displayed and on the shelf. So for example, it might be a plastic crate or it might be a cardboard box, or they might just be displayed in those you know, reusable kind of things that you see in some supermarkets where they slide down. And the shipment packaging is everything that you don't see. It's the stuff that's getting it from the, you know, the milk factory out to the supermarkets, for example, and all the warehousing that's happening in between. And so what we're seeing here is that on the left-hand side, we've got a single-use bottle. It's a bit lighter at 900 grams, and we've got a multi-use bottle that's a bit heavier at 1400 grams. They've both got steel caps. They've both got a polypropylene label but the number of use cycles differs. One versus, we're gonna say in this case, 30. They're both put in reusable crates because for all intents and purposes, they're basically the same sort of thing. They're a, they're a glass bottle. And we're gonna reuse those crates 50 times, but we also potentially have to, to wash some of these things, both the crates and the bottles. And then we've got shipment packaging to get these things out to the customer. So we're saying we're putting one on a wooden pallet that weighs 25 kilograms. That can be used 30 times itself and the number of crates we can get per pallet is 36. So that's the kind of nerdy part in terms of the production of the, the, the bottles. But we also have to look at not just production, but also what happens in terms of end of life. So in the single use case, and even after the reusable bottle, you know, eventually it will reach end of life. Um, I think we said 30 or 50 cycles there. We need to somehow dispose of this. And so we need to find some information. And so you know, what I would generally recommend in Australia or New Zealand is to use the Australian Packaging Covenant Organization's data. They have got quite good information based on material flow analyses that they've done for packaging materials in Australia. And that's also probably the best available data available in either Australia or New Zealand, and New Zealand's quite similar. So here what you can see is that for glass, we've got a recovery rate of about 50%. So that includes all the kind of key losses to get the thing back as well. So it's not just that 50, there's a 50% collection rate, it's that by the time it gets back to the point it can be used, we've only got about 50% left of the material that was produced and put, put into the waste stream. So that's a key factor for us to use in the calculation as well. Now, before I jump into the tool, I also wanted to just do a quick refresher on a few things that we're gonna see once we get some outputs from the tool. So the Gabi packaging calculator captures multiple 
environmental impacts is it does capture the carbon footprint, but it also captures a lot of other things. There's a lot of indicators in the tool. You don't necessarily need to know what they all mean, although they are described in various places. But here's a couple that I just wanted to highlight to give you a bit of a flavor. There's acid rain, you know, which is caused by the indicator we measure as acidification potential. There's algal blooms, which we measure through eutrophication potential. There's summer smog, which is that haze you see over the horizon in big cities like London or Shanghai. And that's got the very sexy kind of name and life cycle assessment as photochemical ozone creation potential, or POCP. Uh, there's also energy use and water consumption, as well as a whole host of other environmental indicators. Now, when you're using the tool, you don't need to understand what all those things mean necessarily. What the tool does is it uses a traffic light system. So, you know, green for good, red for bad, and then it actually uses white if it's in the middle rather than orange. So if it's more, if any particular scenario, the thing that you're looking at is 20% better than the alternative, it'll go green. If it's about the same plus minus 20%, it stays white. And if it's 20% worse, it'll go red. And so that gives you a really quick idea of which particular design is better. So you can say, look at the carbon footprint first, see how it stacks up. And then you can say, okay, do my conclusions change if I look at a whole host of other environmental impact indicators? And if they don't, if you see a whole bunch of green, you know you're onto a winner from you know, the perspective of multiple environmental indicators, not just climate change and carbon footprint. The other thing that's in the tool is something called the material circularity indicator from the Alan MacArthur Foundation. So this isn't an environmental indicator per se, it's rather a metric to help you quantify how circular your particular solution is. And so to give you an idea of how that looks in reality, in a perfect world, you get a, a score of a close to one or 100%, where you're using you know, recycled content, a lot of recycled content, you're using reuse, you know, the number of reuse cycles is less relevant, but essentially you're using a lot of recycled content and you're recycling or reusing at the end of life. In a more realistic world, you might end up with something like what's in the middle there, which is you've got a reasonably good recycled content at 45%, which incidentally is, is roughly the, the average recyc recycled content for flint glass in uh, New Zealand, for example. 50% of bottles being recycled, which is the APCO recycling rate for glass, and one use cycle of each bottle. So that's your kind of realistic scenario. And in the single use case, you'd end up with the one on the right, which is 10% uh, or 0 0.10. And in that case, you've got 0% recycled content, 100% of bottles landfilled, and one use of each bottle. The reason it's not zero is you can actually be worse than that, because you can make a product that is single use, but also performs really badly. So it's got inferior performance to the kind of average on the market. And also you can have situations where you've got such massive manufacturing losses that that also pulls the score down. So that's just to give you a flavor for the different environmental indicators that are available in the tool. Okay, so this is, I've launched the, the Gabby packaging calculator here. I'd pre-logged in, it's, it's a web-based tool, so the only step I'd really skipped is me typing in my login details. And here, what you can see is, is the window that we see. Basically, there's a, there's a range of different tools available. In the case of the packaging calculator, we just have, have one. The platform that this is running in is something called Gabby Envision, which is a kind of a streamlined and easy to use way to access a life cycle assessment model. And in this case, the model that we're using, the packaging calculator, is very specific to packaging products. The thing you need to know about the Garby packaging calculator is that it works a little bit like Microsoft Word, and that you have reports and you have templates. And so the packaging calculator itself is a template, and from that template, you can create many reports. So you can see, like any good TV chef, I've created a, and a you know, here's one I've prepared earlier for this milk packaging example that's pre-completed, so that's a report. And this little icon here with the graph next to it is, is the actual template that, that was created from. So I'm just going to start again from scratch using this template. And from that, I'm going to create this report. So just again, like very similar to Microsoft Word. So I'm going to open this up. Got a question here from Rachel. How are end of life impacts evaluated in terms of the tool? For some materials going to modern landfill will be relatively low impact, whereas if they leak to the environment, there could be dramatic impacts. How complex is the analysis? That's a great question. So we typically evaluate things to what we would call like the elementary flow level, which is the point that the materials actually do flow into the environment. And as you say, for a modern landfill, the, the impact is extremely low because typically they're circulating the leachate and they've got gas capture on top. And so there's not really much interaction with the environment there, in which case there's not really uh, the environmental impact per se. You know, we, we, we do model the impact associated with diesel use to get things to the landfill. We model the impact associated with building the landfill in the first place and, and apportioning that among all the different waste that goes into it. And we do model some leach, leaching to the environment and some gases that go to the environment, but they're relatively small in the scheme of things. So what you will see when you do this um, is 
if you choose landfill, you will see quite low impacts and it's not always what people expect. Great question. And um, hopefully that gives you some insight and we can kind of get into that as we go through. It might be worthwhile adding that LCI obviously can capture a number of indicators, but when we work on a packaging assessment, we also add very often a risk assessment to that, which would then capture exactly those questions. So yep. it's often a combination of approaches and the calculator really just covers that LCA part of it and a risk assessment often comes as a separate step that we would do in a project type scenario. And as you'll see in here, we don't have any indicators for the risk of plastics in the environment. And that's simply because that part of life cycle assessment is actively under development and the indicators aren't really at the stage yet where we can include them. But we will look to include them as they become better. So there is work being done. We've evaluated some of it. It's just not quite at the point yet where we could actually put it into a tool. But we are looking at that and we're, we're of course, very interested in that because we know it's such a topical issue. Okay, great. So what I'm going to do then is I mentioned before the difference between a template and a report. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to save this particular template as a report. So I'm going to create a report from it. So I'm going to create a, a milk bottle comparison example here, and I'm going to save it as a report. And what you can see is that the tool has got two columns of stuff. One currently says baseline and one says alternative. And the idea here is that this tool is generally to be used for making comparisons. You can get it just to calculate the carbon footprint of whatever widget you like, but normally speaking, you need to have um, something that that's relative to so that you can answer the so what question. Because if the, if the end result of this is that the carbon footprint of your product is seven, most people have no idea whether seven is good or bad, and they won't even necessarily know what unit seven is in. And so the reality is you typically need a comparison, but you, you can do, use it for single one-off assessments if you prefer to. So normally one of the first things you might like to do is to rename these things to make them a bit more usable in your case. If you want to switch them off, you just uncheck that box. But in this case, I do want to. So I'm going to say we're going to have the single use glass as this baseline scenario. And the comparison that we're evaluating is a reusable glass, let's say. And I'm just going to click OK. So what that'll do is it just changes the column headers. And the thing to keep in mind with, with the Gabby packaging calculator is that it's always scenarios in columns. So everything that relates to the single use glass that we're going to do is in this left hand side and everything that relates to the reusable glass is here on the right hand side. So what we need to do now is to set this thing up. So we can start by setting up some information about the product or we can flick through and enter some general information about ourselves. So there are these parameters here where we can specify First, the functional units are what we're relating this to. In this case, I'm just going to leave it as the default. There's also some text variables here where you can enter information about who you are and who your report author is, etc. And this will end up in the final report that gets generated automatically from this tool. And then the scenarios part, which is the default view when, when this tool opens, is the interesting part, which is where you enter the information about this particular thing. So if we were looking at uh, one liter of milk, then we could look at, okay, going down this list, what are the things we need to fill out? So the units in the consumer package, that's how many servings are in each consumer pack. So if we assumed each serving size was 100 ml and we've got a one litre of milk, then we have, let's say, 10 serving size, servings in each one. The consumers per display pack, so again, if I just reiterate the hierarchy, consumer packaging is the thing the consumer takes home, so that's the bottle in this case. Display packaging is the thing that the, the pack is in, so that's the crate, a plastic crate in this case, and the shipment packaging is the thing that the crates come on. So that's the stuff that's happening between warehouses and everything else. So that's the pallets and strapping and other materials. So I'm going to have to get you to think back to some of the information that I showed on screen before. You don't have to remember it. I'll, I'll sort of tell you as we go through. But in this particular case, we had 16 bottles per crate. So if I just put that in here, and we had uh, 36 crates per pallet. So I'll just put that information in. One quick question. How many alternatives can you do at one time? The okay. model here, which is a standard version of the Gabby Packaging Calculator, is just two. So it's a two by two, like, well, sorry, one to one comparison or just a single. The reason for that is, is we'd love to give more, but um, it's actually performance related. So we don't want it. We want the tool to run really snappy. And if we put too many scenarios in, the tool has to calculate lots of LCAs. So by default, there's just two, but we can release custom versions of this tool that have as many as you like. So we have, we actually have some models that run 100 scenarios at once. And there's also an Excel based input into this tool that you can use where you can upload that information. So if you really get keen on doing lots of assessment, we can 
extend it out to be however many you want. And then in terms of the net weight here, we've got a liter of milk, so it weighs about a thousand grams. Keep in mind that all these units are in grams, not kilograms or anything else. So just that's one trap to watch out for. The other thing that you'll see here is that I'm not changing is all these things like consumer headspace, dis consumer headspace, display headspace, um, and shipment headspace. What these are is the, the volume left over. It's, it's to calculate um, packaging utilization, so you know, uh, and, and pallet um, utilization. So the idea here is it's more volume based metrics. They don't actually affect the LCA results. Um, so I'm just going to leave them as the defaults. If you knew this information, fantastic, put it in. If you don't, leave it as the default. And you'll see it that in the final report, you actually get a, an analysis done of these different headspace metrics. Um, and given that I'm not a packaging technologist myself, I'm just going to leave that as it is, or a logistics person, I'm just going to leave it as it is. But if that's important to you, welcome to set it. As we go through and type this information, and we have to select which layer we're interested in working in. So the consumer pack, as I mentioned before, is what the consumer takes home with them. So in this case, it's the bottle, but it's also the cap and it's the label. So if we start with a bottle and we expand this glass category, you'll see the materials are grouped into material types. So plastics, bioplastic, laminates, et cetera, glass. In this case, we're looking at a glass bottle. So we're gonna start with glass. We know from doing some weighing or material specifications that the single use bottle weighs 900 grams and the reusable glass bottle weighs 1400 grams. And we could assume that, you know, hey, maybe this is manufactured um, locally. So perhaps it's just 100 kilometers by road to get it to our site, for example. So we've now entered that glass information for those two things. We also need to enter information about the cap. And the cap in this case was steel. So we need to find the right category. So in this case, it's a metal. And in here, we need to specify a man, uh, location of manufacture. So you can just choose from a drop down list here. What you'll see here is that these are quite general. There's not a really full list. And there are some countries like New Zealand, for example, missing from this list. So the tool here, as you see it, the standard version of the Garby Packaging Calculator was developed as a global tool, which is really regionally focused. Um, there'll be another update released in September, which will include New Zealand as well as some other countries, so that we can make it a bit more locally specific. When we first rolled this out, we were already just aiming for performance, so we actually really leaned it out, but we will make it a bit more, and we will add some additional countries there to allow you to model, for example, New Zealand as well. So I'm just going to leave it as Australia for now, and I'm going to select here the metal that we were interested in, which in this case is a... Uh, steel, let's say small part, uh, and it's steel in both cases. And if I just refer to my notes here, the cap for the single use was a slightly lightweight at two grams, and the, there was a heavier weight one for the uh, bottle there. And in terms of recycled content, you know, you can enter that. This one here has a note saying it's for aluminium only. The reason being that for that largely the, the type of steel dictates the recycled content. There's typically speaking always recycled content in, in many steel products. So this one here has an automated recycled content uh, calculation here, but it's particularly relevant for aluminium, which is why this parameter is available, because the difference between virgin and recycled aluminium is about fivefold, you know, or can, can be tenfold or whatever, it depends on the country, but um, you can get very, very large differences for recycled aluminium. In terms of transport, again, we might assume that this is a local um, mill, or maybe it's a little bit further away, so we put in a, a number. In both cases, it's going to be the same, because there's no real difference, it's just a steel cap. One of the most important things that we need to enter here, so we've got the, we've got the cap, we've got the, the glass. One of the most important things we need to do is to specify how many use cycles we actually have. So in the single use case, there's one use cycle, it's used and then disposed. In the reusable one, I think we said we'd have 30 use cycles, so we'll change the number to 30. And there's one final thing that I haven't entered yet, which is around the um, label, which can go here under the plastics category. What you can see is that there's a range of different plastic options. So there's three available by default here within the default, the, 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 the off-the-shelf tool. And in each of these, you can specify to kind of, you know, how it's going to do, what you have, you want to set it up. So in this case, I said it was a BOPP, so um, bioxidly oriented polypropylene. So if I actually click on this right, I choose PP oriented, which is the same as BP, BOPP. And then I think the label I said was one gram in both cases. So we'll put that in. Uh, we choose a manufacturing route. So in this case, it's a film and it might be uncoated perhaps. And compounding means if it's colored. So let's say our label was clear, we wouldn't necessarily compound it. But if it was a white or a colored label, then it would have a compounding stage, which means a pigment or other plastic type is mixed into it. So there's an additional heating step, which increases the environmental impact. 
And here you have a recycled content. So typically speaking, that will be 0% for a label, but you might have uh, uh, greater or lesser recycled content depending on the, the product here. And then, you know, we could assume again, maybe we've got a local manufacturer that's let's say 50 Ks away um, by truck to get this thing to us. Or, or perhaps actually to make it interesting, maybe we assume that actually this is coming from China and we've got sea freight of let's say 9,000 Ks to get it from let's say Shanghai to Sydney or something. Uh, and then maybe there's 100 Ks on either side. There is a quick question around the label. Um, were you talking about printing when you talked about manufacturing or where the label actually came from? The label itself, so where the label is manufactured. Um, printing is one thing we actually exclude from the tool because from our past work, it's actually very, very low impact to the point of being insignificant. And we've tried to keep this tool focused on the stuff that matters most. So there actually isn't a printing step. There's the raw material production. There's the manufacturing route, so the making of a film or an injection molded part or an extrusion part or whatever, but there isn't that final stage of printing because the impact is really low in our experience. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, it's a manufacturing location. And Rachel adds a really good comment with the label, it's likely that this would be washed off and replaced for the reusable option. Yes. So that's a great point. Um, and so at the moment, the tool is set up here to be reusable for just the whole scenario. Um, in the display and shipment packaging, we do have it set up per material type. I'm pushing for the next version to have it changed so that these things can actually be applied at per layer. The reason we didn't initially was to keep it simple, um, but I'm hopeful that in that September release, we can actually make it per material type because it's a great point. Um, as you say, not only will the label be washing off, but it, you'll probably be replacing the cap with a, a a single use cap as well, particularly if the reusable one's coming from a commercial operation. So yeah, great point. Um, at the moment, it's limited to the whole scenario, but as we dive into the display and shipment, you'll see that it's material by material. Yeah, but great question. So for the moment, you would just take 30 times the amount of steel for the reusable scenario and 30 times the amount for the label? Yeah, if you really wanted to model it specifically, I guess you could um, You could actually take up in the reusable here, what would it do? So this is gonna take, yeah, you're right, Barbara, you could do 30 times, yeah. Yeah, that would work. Um, so if we if we really wanted to do that, we could we could do 30 there as an option, for example, at the, at the moment, yeah. And then that would have reuse. Yeah, I think that should cancel itself out. <laughs> so yeah, that would be a workaround, I guess. I'll change it back to one just so that in case I get that wrong and it doesn't make sense when we get to the results. But yeah, that's a good point. For the display packaging here, this is where we were talking about a, a plastic crate. It could also be a cardboard box, for example. But let's say we were using a plastic crate um, as an example. And here, let's assume it's manufactured in Australia again. And then basically here, I think we said our, our crate weighs two kilograms, so 2,000 grams. It's made of HDPE, it's injection molded, it's colored, so it is compounded. They usually are colored. And often in this case, they do contain recycled content. So let's say you wanted to have a nice little um, marketing campaign where you're recycling you know, old HDPE bottles into crates that you're then using to transport your glass bottles. Um, we enter maybe 50% recycled content. And again, you put in a manufacturing location, which is whatever it is, you know, 100 k's down the road, or it's in China or it's wherever and you put that information in here. So, yeah, comparing two different options, um, and that's that. And then, I mean, if we had any additional packaging, we could put it in here, but probably there isn't too much at this layer. What there will be, though, is also the shipment packaging here. And we've got, we said we had a um, wooden pallet. So if we go into natural materials and we go into wood, we can then say, okay, well, we said it was 25 kgs. So trappers, you've got to enter the zeros, 25 kgs. And the number of use cycles, I think I said before was 30. So putting that in here. Transport to packaging site. This is from the manufacturer of the pallet. So let's say that's coming from some place that's in a forest or something that's coming a bit further away. So it's maybe 500 k's or, or whatever. Put that in. And you could also enter other information in here. So let's say you had plastic strapping, for example, that hold all the stuff together. You might have a plastic, and here it's entered a bit differently. And so let's say we had a PET strap, and what you can see here is, oh, that one doesn't specify like that, but what you could see before with the natural materials one here is the use cycles was per material rather than at the top. And in this case here, it assumes it's all single use. So massive film. Um, if we had here, like, a, let's say there was, I don't know, 500 grams, 
of straps per pallet or kilogram or whatever. And let's assume maybe there's no recycled content and hey, maybe they're made in China again. So just assume say 9,000 Ks of transport by sea and maybe, you know, 100 Ks by road. Okay, so that's just setting up some strapping. It's setting up the, the pallet and that allows us to kind of make a comparison of, of this. What we haven't done yet is we haven't filled the glass bottles. We haven't distributed it to customer and we haven't done end of life. So in this packaging and filling section, this is where you can enter information for the actual filling process. So this would be putting milk into the bottle, screwing the cap on, whatever it happens to be. There's information here if you, if you fill in a, in a controlled atmosphere, so carbon dioxide or nitrogen atmosphere. And there's also information if you're using water or natural gas or whatever to do this. In this particular case, um, I actually want to sh shoehorn this because this, as I mentioned, is a general tool. We can create custom versions, but let's say you wanted to just use this generic version to be able to do this assessment. We know we need to wash the bottles and we know we only really need to wash the reusable ones because um, the single use ones will come kind of clean from the factory and they might be pre-cleaned, but that will be the same in both cases. So let's say we just um, use this to, to do what we want it to do. And let's say we'd done some work to say that we needed 0.5 of a megajoule to wash a single bottle. And you can see here that this is a listing as per functional unit. And you might not remember it, but back in that global settings tab before we could specify what the functional unit was. And I said that it was one consumer package, which is per bottle. So what that means is that this information here is being entered per bottle. So we're, we're washing this particular thing. And so we could potentially put that in. Um, we could potentially also say that we've got some water being used, for example, for the cleaning operation, which might be this. And we just have to be conscious of what this relates to, whether it's per bottle or whether we actually need it 30 times. So I'm just going to enter this once, but we'd have to be conscious of is, if that is the washing per bottle and we've got 30 you know, cycles, we need to just think about how that information is going to be apportioned. Um, but what I'm effectively doing is using this generic uh, section, which has information on energy and water, to be able to put information in about bottle washing, because that wasn't part of the kind of standard tool design, but is important for this particular comparison. So the intention of this is just to show you how to make this more generic when you want to model something that's specific, but a little bit outside of the scope of what we'd imagined when we created this. And then in terms of distribution here, let's say that the average distance from the, the bottling company, the milk bottler, to the customer was, let's say, 100 Ks. And in the case of the reusable scenario, let's say we had to also get it back. So maybe it was 200 Ks. And again, you know, the thing to be conscious of is just what this relates to, whether it's one bottle or 30 bottles or whatever. But I'm just going to put it like this here to keep it simple, just to show, show the example. And then we can, you know, we can always come back to that later if that's inappropriate. In terms of end of life packaging, we know that we've got to deal with the glass bottle itself. We know we've got to deal with the metal and we know we've got to deal with the plastic. So you only have to set up the parts of this that are relevant to your product type. So we've got a glass bottle. We know we've got something that we have to do with it. These recycling rates we could see from the APCO data are optimistic. So let's say we put in the, the real rate, 50%. And we'll assume that the remainder is landfilled. These numbers are free text, so you can just enter them to be whatever that you want them to be. That brings, I guess it's both a blessing and a curse. We can help you with providing data for this for the end markets you're interested in. But the thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, waste and recycling and things is very, very location specific. You know, in Australia and New Zealand, we don't really have any municipal waste incineration plants, but, you know, across parts of developed Asia and across Europe, they're very, very common. And so you end up with very different end of life scenarios depending on where you are. So this is, this is good enough for Australia and New Zealand, but it would be different in other countries. Um, and if we also focus in on the other things that we've got, we had some steel. And here we've got a recycling rate of 95% and a landfill rate of 5%. That's probably optimistic. Um, we could refer back to the APCO um, data, if I want a few slides back here. And you can see here that for steel, there's actually a, a capture rate in the packaging stream of only 44%. So while the overall recycling rate in Australia, for example, for steel is about 90%, it gets really bogged down or it gets sort of um, adjusted quite heavily because of the fact there's very heavy things from buildings and construction that, that adjust that number. When you look at packaging, you're dealing with a lot of small parts that are often lost in material recovery facilities. And so you can see the recycling rate there is actually much lower than you might expect. And so if we assume it's 44% to recycling and maybe the remainder to landfill, for example. So we can say, okay, uh, uh, 44% here to recycling, and we can go the remaining 60, uh, 50, 
56%, let's check my basic maths here, sorry, 56% uh, here to landfill. And then we also had a label and we had a bunch of other stuff. You know, we can go and set them up one at a time. So if you want to do that, you can do it. You can go in here and say, okay, we had a PET label. And so we could say, okay, we've got incineration here of 50% and recycling of 50%. That's definitely not happening. So we'll get rid of that. And to be honest with the label, you have to say that the, the recycling of that's going to be challenging. So for the, the product that goes to landfill, it's going to end up the label on the bottle. And for the 50% of bottles that are going to recycling, you know, I think it's pretty unlikely they're going to be able to get that label off and recycle it. So I'm just going to make a, a blanket assumption here that it's this. You could even possibly argue the incineration case if you wanted to, because the glass furnace is fairly hot, but I'm presuming they strip them off in advance. So there's, there's a little bit of knowledge that's required to kind of put in some of these things. Organizations like APCO have a lot of data available, and particularly if you're an APCO member. Um, they're, they're a good port of call for this kind of information. And if you're using something like, you know, some of the, the, the many tools that are out there for assessing recyclability, you can plug in some of the specific information that you have in here. Okay, so I'm just going to focus in on those parts. We could also look at the pallets and everything else, but I don't really want to get too bogged down, or maybe maybe we should do the pallet because it's heavy. And we could say, okay, you know, in this case, incineration is more likely because it burns nicely as firewood. So maybe we said it goes 50-50 landfill and we don't recycle any of it, potentially, you know, as an example. Okay, so that's kind of all the key things we need to fill out. So I'm just going to save that now. And when I click the button, I'm going to run the analysis and we're going to start to get some results. So I'm going to just push this button here, the two inter interlocked arrows, and it'll it says calculate report. The tool will tell us that it's busy calculating. It'll run a full life cycle assessment in the background, and then it will start to generate a series of charts and tables for us to look through and also a full report that's downloadable as either a PDF document or as a document called RTF, which stands for Rich Text Format, which is a, basically a Word document. So it's a simplified Word document that you can just open up in Word and edit. And so you can see that here on the right, you've got your Tables and Charts tab, and you've got your PDF preview. So um, the analysis takes about 30 seconds to run, and once it's run, I'll pull open this Table and Charts tab, and we can then talk through that. So and if anyone got does one have question, Jeff. Yep. Just in time on end of life for bioplastics, what does that cover? Is it bio-based materials or biodegradable compostables? It is, it's related to whatever's in the front end of the tool. So maybe if I can, I don't know if it'll let me show you this, it does while we're looking. So here we've got a bioplastic section. And here what you can see is you've got a range of different bioplastic options. So most of these are drop-in most of these are drop-in conventional. And so you can see you've got HDPE from a range of feedstocks, corn, sugar beet, sugar cane, wheat. Um, same for LDPE, for LLDPE, and a whole bunch of others. You've got some that are actual bioplasts. So the, these are bio-based biodegradables like PO, PLA. Um, and then you've got bio-based conventional non-biodegradable. And so if we look at those, it relates to these inputs. And then when we go to end of life here, and we drill into end of life for bioplastics that there relates to that whole set so you need to kind of be conscious of what you enter in as to what you specify here because clearly composting isn't going to work for a bio-based polypropylene for example or bio-based hdpe because it's not a drop-in so if you use pla then you can enter the information here for pla but you you know and put in composting, for example, assuming it goes to industrial composting. But, you know, if you were using bio-based drop-in plastics, then you'd have to sit in the, the more conventional route and it'd be recycled at, or landfill as normal. So it really depends on what you input as to what you should enter here. And the tool is designed to be relatively generic just because, you know, we don't want to overcomplicate it. But as I said before, we can actually produce custom versions of this that get into more detail. And then you'd be able to specify these, for example, per material type if you really wanted to get that level of detail. So yeah, great question. Um, hey. Basically, you need to know what the most likely end of, end of life scenario is. The yep. tool doesn't choose that for you, depending on what input. That's right. And so what you can see here now is something that looks like that picture we had before, but sort of filled out in a bit more detail. So what you can see is when you scroll over these things, you can see the different layers. So in the Garby packaging calculator speak, CP is consumer packaging, DP, display packaging, SP, shipment packaging, and then you've got your... Um, your, I think that's your filling information, uh, your packaging and filling, which is your P, um, D is your distribution, and this is your end of life. And so you can see, you know, 
a sort of different distribution here on this. You can see some reasonably interesting kind of outcomes. Overall, the reusable glass is stacking up well. Where you probably have to make sure you're being quite careful is in this phase here and this phase here, which is your packaging, your, sorry, your, um, which is called packaging filling, which is where we've put the washing information and then your distribution. So you can see that those, this bar here doesn't exist in the other one and this bar here is much larger. The reason being that we have to do the reverse logistics. And so I think here's where you just want to be careful what you're putting into the tool to make sure it actually does reflect the number of use cycles you're thinking of. And that's where we can help you to kind of model that correctly. Um, and there's a guide that comes with the, the calculator that kind of helps you through it and how to use it. But the idea is there that you kind of, you're entering information for the product. You can see that the actual production impacts are drastically lower for the reusable glass, which you'd expect because you're only making one bottle in 30. But you've got, you know, additional burdens associated with, for example, you know, filling and washing, sorry, um, with transport and then potentially also with how you manage other, you know, other parts of the packaging. You know, you've got a heavier cap, you've got other, whatever else you might have. Mm. And so that kind of gives you an idea to compare the carbon footprint of the two options. And as I mentioned before, um, you know, you also might be interested in looking at other environmental impact indicators. And so what you can see here is you can see single use glass in the left hand column, reusable glass in the right hand column. You can see a whole just massive list of different environmental indicators, acidification, different forms of climate change, eutrophication, which is algal blooms and waterways, nutrient loading, um, ionizing radiation, which is radioactive waste from nuclear power stations in the very distant supply chain, not hugely relevant here, um, land use, ozone depletion, so whatever, lots of different indicators. But the key point is that what you can see is a sea of green and a little bit of white at the end. So the water scarcity is not coming up as hot because we're washing the bottles. And if we had to do more washing, then it might end up going red. Um, but what you can see is broadly with the information entered, we're ending, we're ending up with quite a good outcome for the reusable glass option. And so the nice thing about a traffic light system is you don't have to be an environmental expert to really understand what you know, marine eutrophication is. All you really need to see is that actually by looking at the carbon footprint only, which is telling us that the reusable is a good idea, we can see that the, all the other indicators apart from this one, which is sort of closer, are backing us up. And so you know that, that you know, looking at these other indicators isn't going to change your conclusions. Mm. There's more detailed information further down, breaking it down by packaging layer and things, but that's kind of the core information. And Barbara, was there a question there? Yes, there is. Um, someone's wondering if there might be an error with the end of life, because shouldn't it be a fraction of single use impact due to reuse 30 times? Yeah, I was it just looking at the same for both. And thinking the same. Very good point. I asked myself oh. the same question. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Yeah, that's a great question. I was just wondering about that myself. I think the issue could be that the end of life here, it actually looks at all packaging layers together. So what you're seeing is the end of life impacts coming from the consumer packaging, the display packaging, and the shipment packaging all at the same time. And what I wonder is if maybe I entered the number of reuse cycles, the number of use cycles for one of the secondary or tertiary packaging to be uh, one single use, then what we'd have is the impact of a kind of heavy uh, secondary or tertiary packaging coming through you know, every single time. And so if we look at, if I go here to look at the shipment packaging um, and I pop down into the natural materials and the wood, I can see that I've got 30 reuse cycles in both cases here. So that's what I did plan to enter, but I might just go and check display packaging as well. And here, if I go under the plastics, and here the crate, what you can see, I've got a single reuse cycle specified in each case. So effectively, it's as if the that big heavy HDPE crate is being used just once to deliver the bottles. Um, and really what I'd intended was to enter 50 in both cases. So if I put that back in and I then click this button here to calculate the results, hopefully we're going to start to see something that looks a lot more expected. So we'll just give that a moment to um, calculate again, and then we'll see if that fixes the problem. So great, that's finished now. And here what you can see is um, there's something that looks a lot more expected. So you've got a much smaller impact here, 0.004 for the reusable glass. And here you've got a higher impact, 0.013 for the single use because we're disposing of more bottles. And all of a sudden those big heavy single use uh, H crates are now multi-use and only being disposed of much more infrequently. And so I think, yeah, this really highlights for this sort of tool, it's kind of garbage in equals garbage out. You have to make sure you get the data in correctly to get some sensible numbers out. So thanks for raising it. Great question. If everyone is taking a moment, I might just ask Rachel a slightly longer question now. Mm -hmm. So Rachel was wondering, 
if that plastics, plastic resins are manufactured in various places around the world, right. they're then made into a product. When you're talking region of manufacturing, this is end of manufacturing. What about the resin itself? She's yeah. assuming that the footprint will be different depending on whether it's from the US, with shale gas, Middle East, oil or bio-based. Presumably this is the same for other material types as well. E.g. aluminium from New Zealand is about 30% lower carbon than from overseas. Yeah, um, so the way the tool is structured is it assumes that resins are largely a global average. So for PET, HCP, LDPE, um, it assumes that it's a, it's a global, coming off the global market because they're typically purchased off the global market. And so, yes, there are differences depending on where they're made, but the differences are not nearly as pronounced as for something like aluminium. So when we've looked at differences between resins in the past, like manufacturing China versus the Middle East versus Europe, you do see some differences, but the differences aren't huge. And so we've taken the kind of global average approach for the resin because that's typically how you buy it. Um, and where we specify the regional part is in the transport to get it to, and then more importantly, the manufacturing of it into something. So the extrusion, the film production, the injection molding, that's all specific. So when you choose the country from the box, it connects up the right electricity mix to do that particular part of the step. But yeah, for resins, we assume global average. For aluminium, in this particular tool, we also assume global average, but we are looking to include it to be uh, custom, like to, to make it specifiable so that you can choose a region of manufacture. Because as you point out, you know, aluminium made in somewhere like New Zealand has a carbon footprint between four and five kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram. Whereas aluminium made in China is over 20. So you've got a fourfold difference. Mm. Um, and then if you recycle, you know, then that's different again. So the recycling we can handle by kind of connecting up the energy mix, but for aluminium, we are looking to, to change that because that's when we've got the greatest variation. For a lot of other things like glass, plastics, uh, steel, it's actually less relevant on geography because steel is really about you know, burning coal to, 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 to produce the iron, to produce, uh, to produce the, the iron ore to produce iron. And that's really where the impact comes from. It doesn't really matter where you make it. Plastics are coming from oil, this, you know, large oil refinery processing stage. It's largely quite similar. And so you don't end up with quite the degree of difference as you do with aluminium, which is really an electrically driven process. Um, so yeah, aluminium, absolutely, completely agree. For some of the others, we just take a global average with global forcing. Someone makes a comment that surely the end of life should be actually the same for both because they both end up at end of life once. That's correct for a single bottle, but if we look at our functional unit of delivering, say, 30 litres of milk, we need one reusable bottle, but we would need 30 single-use bottles. That's why the end of life for the single use should actually be higher. So we would expect it to be higher. And if you look at this example that I have on screen now, it, it is. And you can see also that the end of life, I had no idea why it was so big before. I, I must have entered something really stupidly wrong. What you can see here is you can see a, quite a small number here, 0 0.004 for the single use, for the reusable, sorry. And for the single use, you can see a, a larger number. Um, the reason it's not 30 times is because you've also got transport to end of life, which is, a, you know, sort of messing with it a little bit. So you've got a few other things that are happening that aren't just related to just the end of life, straight end of life impact, but you are seeing a difference in those two there. And um, you can see that the end of life impacts also really tiny, which is what you'd expect. So I really have no idea what I did <laughs> in that previous example, but I've ended something very wrong that's ended up giving us some bizarre results. And I guess that highlights one other point when using these tools, you do have to be quite careful because it is effectively garbage in, garbage out. So if you're not quite careful in what you enter, you can very easily do something that doesn't make any sense. And so it's important to use your own common sense. And if it doesn't make sense, to question why. And I'd love to say that I ran this example deliberately hoping to screw it up so someone would pick it up. I didn't, but even still it's great that you did see it. And you can see here that there, there was a mistake. I've entered something wrong and I need to go back and work out what I did. But those end of life impacts for an inert material in the landfill, very high, right? And you, know, you might reasonably ask the question why and you know, Clearly, I've made a mistake, so apologies. Someone else asked if there is a feature that captures the resources saved due to reuse, e.g. one bottle versus 30 bottles. And, well, what, what it really shows is how much more you would need for the single use. And there is an indicator on resource use where that is quite clearly shown. Yeah, so you see there's a resource use indicator here in the full table. 
Um, you've also got resource use from the perspective of energy that's here as well. Um, so yeah, there are some resource use indicators, yeah. Generally speaking, it's, it's not really showing savings in one because both have an impact. Just one has a higher impact really. So it, it shows that um, yeah, the lower impact of one and the higher impact of the other. So it doesn't necessarily give a, say a credit to the one using less, but it gives less of a burden to the one using less, if that makes sense. Yeah. 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 And yeah, just to be clear, the tool, it doesn't do the comparisons for you. It just presents them side by side and uses the traffic light to highlight for you. So you can, of course, take it out and do percentage comparisons, et cetera, but you do have to be a little bit careful. And so there's some caveats in that report that when you're, when you're communicating the results of a comparison using life cycle assessment or product carbon footprinting, you can communicate it one to one without any kind of review. But as soon as you want to go to public claims, there's a requirement in the ISO standards which suggests that you, you have to use or go through a three party critical review. So you have to have a panel of experts review your claims. And so the tool doesn't encourage the direct comparison here by putting percentages and all sorts of other things because of the fact that we, you know, you have to use that information with caution. So we use traffic lights to give you an idea of better or worse. But the reality is if you do want to say, are oh, we saving 30%, you can calculate that from this, but we'd encourage you only ever to communicate that internally or to, to customers or suppliers one-to-one. -one. And if you do want to go public, then that's where you need to go through a process. You can definitely do it using this tool or with some, uh, some further support, but there's, a, there's quite an involved process under the ISO standards to, to do that work. Um, just, just to avoid sort of bad, bad claims like my glass bottle one that I showed before. The idea really is that this tool helps internal decision-making, helps understanding some of the hotspots and to, to show where you, would you need to dive deep, uh, deep dive, <laughs> dive <think>. deeper <laughs> if you wanted to change your packaging and to really make some significant decisions. It's to highlight those hotspots and potential environmental impacts. Yeah. Exactly. And perhaps one last thing I can show, because I'm, I'm conscious we're, we're running low on time, is that there's also this PDF report that gets generated here. And so it's just busy generating this report here. It looks really long, 38 pages, but the last sort of 30 pages or so are just a direct printout of all the settings that you put into the tool just so that you can replicate it. Um, what it what it does here, it's got a whole bunch of stuff saying enter title here because I didn't put any information in. If I put information in, it would have come through. It shows you like that it's comparing, you know, the two different alternatives and it gives you a whole bunch of information about it um, and tells you the different methods that are used and etc cetera, etc cetera. but it includes the same charts that are there it includes the results and the traffic light comparison it talks about what the results mean so it converts them into equivalency so how how long driving in a car it is or how much energy is equivalent to using a laptop for a certain number of hours or whatever um, so it tries to relate them, the, the indicators to something that's meaningful and it also talks about the material circularity results that we talked about. So the score of the single use is 0.57 and the score of the reusable is 0.984. Appreciate that's probably quite small, so I'm reading it out. It breaks the results down in more detail and it also includes right at the end a list of all the information that you put into the tool um, as it was entered so that you've got that for future reference. So the idea of this is, is something that you can save and say you were doing work in you know, an environmental management system to show continuous improvement or use you know, an ISO 14001 and, uh, environmental management system and you should, had to show evidence of life cycle thinking. This is the kind of evidence you could save and, and store internally to show that you're really sort of doing your due diligence. And if customers were to ask, for example, you know, what if we did this or that, um, you know, would this be better or worse? You can then sort of do that, those comparisons for them and say, okay, hey, actually, you know, what we're doing is already probably looking better than, than the alternative. So it's just an idea, uh, you know, a kind of a quick way of doing some life cycle assessment in a structured way that's specific to packaging that helps you get to some outcomes quite quickly without, you know, having to be an LCA expert. Though I do caution that you still need to sort of use your common sense. And if it doesn't make sense, you know, do some internal review in your own company, you know, by all means, talk through it with us. And, you know, if it doesn't make sense, we'll just look into it and, and check that it's being entered correctly. Great, thank you. So if you have any further questions regarding the calculator, please feel free to reach out to Jeff directly. Um, we also are running a couple more webinars.
And then in June and July, we've got a few more planned around the living standards framework and SDGs, also a life cycle approach to scope three emissions and a bit more detail on how to quantify the circular economy. If any of those capture your interest, let us know and register for them. Any more questions to Jeff, feel free to reach out. So thanks to you all for coming along this afternoon. Thanks Jeff for showing us the calculator and we will hope to see you all next time. Thanks everyone. Bye.